Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm continuing my research into the programmable input-output features of the RP2040. Last time, in order to understand how VGA video can be generated by the Pico, I dipped my toe into the waters of direct memory access. I also dabbled in pulse width modulation. This time, I'm jumping down the DMA and PWM rabbit hole. Spoiler alert, even though this is the PIO Chronicles, I'm not going to actually do any PIO work today. Understanding DMA and PWM are tools to get even more out of PIO. So why don't you join me as we do a deeper dive into direct memory access and pulse width modulation. Check out this pattern of these LEDs. You're getting sleepy, very sleepy. As you can see, this is being generated by the Raspberry Pi Pico. I can hear some of you saying, what's so special about that? I can do that with a couple dozen lines of MicroPython code. But what if I were to tell you that after this is running, it doesn't use a single cycle of processor time, not one. This is all being done with direct memory access and pulse width modulation. These two features, along with PIO, allow the RP2040 to do all kinds of things with minimal processor involvement. Let's do a quick refresh of DMA. For more information, please see my Introduction to DMA video. From this bus fabric diagram, you can see that there are four AHP bus masters that are the only devices that can generate addresses. Two of these devices are the DMA read port and the DMA write port, with the other two being the two processor cores. All four bus masters can address any four different downstream ports at the same time, including PWM and PIO. In my previous DMA video, I showed how a DMA channel can transfer blocks of data both to PWM and PIO, but a DMA channel can also transfer data to another DMA channel. This allows one DMA channel to change the read block, write block, number of transfers, and other control functions of another DMA channel. The low-level operation of DMA is controlled by entering data into a number of specific registers. The C, C++ SDK has simplified entering the data, but I find it's good to understand what the registers do. The list of registers and addresses can be found in section 2.5.7 of the RP2040 data sheet. In addition to a number of general DMA control registers, each of the 12 DMA channels has four registers called control blocks that define what the channel will do. These registers are the read address pointer, the write address pointer, the transfer count, and a control register. When one DMA channel configures another DMA channel, it writes information to one or more of these registers. The last of the four registers is also the trigger register. That is, when written to, it starts the DMA channel that has just been configured. Here's an illustration of how this works. Let's say we want to reconfigure the DMA channel to grab data from different same-sized blocks and then write the data to a peripheral like a UART which always has the same address. Because the configuring DMA transfers a string of data, it first writes the new read address, then the same write address, the same transfer count, and the same control data. When it writes the data to the control register, it transfers control to the reconfigured DMA channel. Having to write data to four registers just to change the first one seems like a waste of time and data. Many times you want to reconfigure only one or two settings of a DMA channel, so the RP2040 was designed to have four different aliases, which are different orders of the registers. Let me demonstrate. Here's the order of registers for each of the four aliases. If we were to use alias 3 in our first example, we could change the read block and start the reconfigured DMA chain with just one write instead of four, saving time and data. Each alias has a different offset from the base, as you can see by this table. Again, the SDK simplifies this task by keeping track of the offset for a given DMA channel and alias. We'll use DMA channel chaining and aliases later to develop our LED pattern but next I need to dive into the pulse width modulation on the RP2040. 
not just to writing a register using MicroPython, but unearthing some of the gory inner workings. PWM alone could be an entire series, so I can't cover everything here, but I hope to give you enough info to understand how we can use it in conjunction with DMA to blink our LEDs. I'm assuming that you know that PWM is a way of simulating an analog signal by rapidly pulsing an output while varying its duty cycle. If you want more basics on PWM, I'll put a link to a helpful video in the description below. The RP2040 has eight identical PWM slices. Each slice can drive a PWM signal on two GPIO pins, one for channel A and one for channel B. All 30 GPIOs can be tied to a PWM output. However, since there are only 16 distinct PWM outputs, GPIO 16 through 29 share the PWM output with GPIO 0 through 13. Each PWM slice consists of a 16-bit counter and counter comparator combined with a fractional clock divider to slow the counter as desired. Each PWM slice can also measure a duty cycle of an input. A lot of flexibility to control the frequency and phase of the clock has been incorporated into the RP2040. The duty cycle of each PWM channel is derived from comparing the value of the PWM slice's free-running 16-bit counter with the channel's 16-bit counter compare register. As illustrated here, when the counter is less than the counter compare register, the PWM output is high. As soon as the counter's value is higher than the counter compare register, the output goes low. The higher the value of the counter compare register, the longer the signal stays high, eventually reaching 100% when the counter comparer reaches FFFF hex or 65,535 decimal. The counter compare register for the PWM slice is 32 bits long and carries the data for both PWM channels. The least significant 16 bits hold the counter compare level for channel A, and the most significant 16 bits hold the counter compare level for channel B. Now I think it's time for our example. I'll put a link to this program in the description below. In this program, I use four DMA channels to send PWM level information to four PWM slices, each driving two GPIO pins for a total of eight LEDs. First, I generate the level information and store it in two arrays, one for PWM channel A and one for channel B. Then I use two DMA channels to send configuration data to the other two DMA channels that send the LED level information to the PWM slices. Each DMA channel starts the next one and the result is this pattern. Let's go through the program in detail. We'll include the standard library as well as the DMA and PWM libraries. Next, we'll set GPIO 0 through 7 as PWM outputs. We'll capture the PWM slice numbers for each GPIO for use later. Remember, there's one PWM slice for every two GPIOs. We're now going to configure those PWM slices. First, we'll get started with the PWM default configuration. The SDK defines this default as free running at system clock speed with no phase correction wrapping at FFFF hex and with standard polarities for both channels A and B. In the default configuration, the PWM counter runs at the system clock frequency. This is too fast for us to see the fading effect, so we'll slow down the PWM counter by a factor of 8. With the PWM counter using 65,536 cycles, the frequency for one PWM timer cycle becomes 125 megahertz divided by 65,536 divided by 8, or 238 hertz. We'll be transferring 512 words per LED, resulting in an off to on to off period of a little over two seconds. Now apply the modified configuration to each of the four PWM slices. To make this work, we'll use DMA to transfer four sets of data. Two data DMA channels will transmit the PWM LED fade information for PWM channels A and B. 
I'll refer to them as Fade DMA Channel A and Fade DMA Channel B. The other two DMA channels transfer reconfiguration data to the first two data DMA channels to allow them to move from PWM slice to PWM slice. I'll call those Control DMA Channel A and Control DMA Channel B. Here we claim four DMA channels and assign the DMA channel names. To generate the LED fade level for each of the PWM slices, I'll create two arrays with 512 32-bit words each, one for each PWM channel. I'll load the arrays with data that increases and then decreases the level I send to the counter compare register. Because I want the data to repeat, to make things easy, I'll align the data arrays to a naturally occurring address boundary. In this case, since each array is 512 32-bit words or 2048 bytes long, I'll align them on a 2048-byte boundary. Remember that the slice counter compare register is 32 bits long, with bits 0 through 15 assigned to channel A, and bits 16 through 31 assigned to channel B. I'll fill the fade DMA channel A array with increasing values from 0 to 65,535, and then decreasing back to 0. Bits 16 through 31 are kept at zero to keep the channel B off. I'll do the same for fade DMA channel B, except I'll shift the data bits left 16 bits to leave bits zero through 15 at zero so that channel A stays off and channel B fades from off to full brightness to off again. Now I'll fill an array with the addresses of the PWM counter compare registers for each of the PWM slices. The control DMA channels will use that data to reconfigure the data DMA channels to send the fade data to different PWM slices. These addresses can be found in section 4.5.3 of the RP2040 data sheet. Next, we'll prepare the configuration structure for our four DMA channels. I'll begin with the data DMA channels and then move to the control DMA channels. I'll start out with the default DMA configuration. This transfers 32 bits at a time, increments the read address each time, and doesn't increment the write address. I don't need the following three statements since the default is already set, but I'll go through them just so you can see the syntax of the statements. The first is to set up the transfer to 32 bits. The next is to increment the data read address every time a transfer is made. This lets us grab consecutive data into the DMA channel. The last is to not increment the data write address every time a transfer is made. This is used to direct the DMA channel to write to the same address each time, like a peripheral such as PWM. The next statement is what makes DMA so powerful. The chain command transferred DMA control from the current DMA channel to a new one as specified in the command. This command transfers execution of the DMA process to control DMA channel B after the current transfer has been completed. The set data requisition command allows the DMA process to be throttled by the peripheral we select. In this case, the DMA channel will wait until the PWM slice is ready to receive more data before the transfer continues. This command sets the address wrapping parameters. This works with the attribute align statements earlier to determine how we repeat the data. In this case, the fade array contains 512 32-bit words or 2048 bytes. This command specifies the number of bytes of the changing part of the address. In this case, since 2048 is 2 to the 11th power, the ring size is 11. The configuration of the other data DMA channel is nearly identical except it changed to a different control DMA channel after it is complete. The control DMA channels transfer the write address to the data DMA channels and then start the data DMA process. The control DMA configurations are nearly the same as the data DMA channels with three exceptions. First, we don't need to specify a data request source 
since the DMA channel control blocks will take data as quickly as it's sent. Second, the control DMA channels chain to the data DMA channels. Third, the data set is only four 32-bit words or 16 bytes. Since 16 equals 2 raised to the fourth power, we'll set the wrapping bit size to 4. Now it's time to link the DMA channel configuration structures we created to the DMA channels. We'll use the DMA channel configuration statement to assign a configuration structure to a DMA channel, assign the initial write address, assign the initial read address, tell the DMA channel how many transfers to make, and when to start the transfer sequence. Let's go through one of the data DMA channels first. This statement assigns the Fade DMA Channel A configuration to the DMA channel named Fade DMA Chan A. This parameter assigns the first PWM slice counter compare register as a starting address for the write process. This value will be modified later by the control DMA channel, which we will cover next. This parameter tells us to read the data values from array fade A. This parameter instructs the DMA to transfer 512 values before it completes. And this one instructs the DMA channel not to start yet. This statement is very similar to one I presented in my previous PIO DMA episode 8. This statement initializes one of the control DMA channels, that is, the channel that reconfigures the data DMA channel. First, the control DMA channel A configuration is assigned to control DMA channel A. Next is a little trick. Here we set the write address to be alias2 write address trigger of fade DMA channel A. Earlier in this video, I introduced you to the four aliases that a DMA channel uses for its control block. Since we only want to change the write address, we can use alias2 to write the new address to the data DMA channel and immediately trigger that data DMA channel to start with only one value. This saves time and memory locations. We could use any other alias to load the write data, but we would have to reload any other data before we got to the trigger register. This parameter tells the DMA channel to read the data from the array holding the address locations. We'll only transfer one word, and we won't start the DMA channel quite yet. The next statement is similar, except it modifies the fade DMA channel B. Finally, we'll start control DMA channel A by using the DMA start channel mask. Once everything is running, just enter an endless loop in sleep. I originally tried using the tight loop contents function instead of sleep, but that didn't work. I have a theory that both the DMA and the processor are trying to access the same memory block at the same time. This would result in the DMA never getting a chance to read the level data. I've already told you more than I know, so this will require more investigation. However, for now, the LEDs just keep rolling along with no involvement from the main processors. Pretty cool. Thanks for joining me today. We did a deep dive into DMA and PWM. Although I didn't discuss PIO during this episode, I hope you can see where DMA and PIO together could really automate your data transfer tasks. I'm not sure where I'm going next, but understanding the gory details of generating video from the Pico is kind of appealing. Leave me your, a comment if you have suggestions for something you would like to see. If you like this video or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!